Hi, kitty cats. Today on the show, we have what in the world makes Barbie such a controversial movie? Uh, how a new friend of mine helped open my eyes to the greater issues in mental health around youth developing their own identity. And finally, a couple of conversations that I had reminded me how gender and gender identity are understood in, you know, sort of the greater uh, community. Uh, all this and no doubt much more today on the Dingbat Diaries for the week of August 4th, 2023. I am Amethyst Herrick, your hostess for the program. All I want to mention is that this work is supported by subscribers of my Substack publication. And if you like this content, please go to my Substack publication. It's linked in the show notes. Subscribers, when you subscribe, receive emails every time I publish new content. They're able to interact with me directly through Substack, for whatever that might be worth. And finally, um, I'm also working on a new publication website and subscribers to my stub Substack publication will receive a subscription to that Identity and Gender Theory website when it is launched sometime in August. Okay, I'm coming to you apparently from a land of thunder and guys um, like mowing their lawns. I'm not really sure why these two happen at the same time. Thunder, lightning, and lawn mowing. But if you hear all that outside, there you go. This is what it means living in suburbia. And speaking of suburbia, the Barbie movie. Now, I understand, if you're following me at all, you know I saw Barbie this week. Um, you may be wondering, Amy, really, why do you keep talking about this movie? I published an article about it on Tuesday because I was so uh, emotionally overcome by the movie. I recorded that particular article me reading it on Wednesday, which was released today on Friday. And believe it or not, my wife and I went and saw the movie again yesterday. So no doubt you're wondering why I have to keep talking about this. But when I started thinking about the movie, I, I really wondered, you know, I've read a lot of articles on Medium about how conservatives are kind of up in arms about this movie. And I'm just, you know, there, I don't have a whole lot of spoilers here. There are some minor spoilers, but not huge. The first point is, it's not about Barbie the doll. Like, if you thought it was just going to be about kids playing with Barbies, well, you're kind of wrong. She is honored. Barbie is honored in the film. Barbie is treated like the American icon that she is, like this icon of femininity that probably most conservatives can get next to. Um, the movie's also been called a feminist manifesto. And I wanna, I wanna just think about that for a moment. Barbie, a feminist manifesto. Barbie, the doll that has fueled decades of therapy for low self-image in women across the land. This is a feminist manifesto. Seems odd. Um, and finally, you know, the movie is also, also criticized for taking shots at patriarchy as a general, just in general, and further how women are treated in the world. Now, I don't know if conservatives look around at all. There is an existing patriarchy and women are not treated particularly well. I, I guess maybe there's a problem about talking about reality in a movie that, um, you know, just, just, just irks them. Western society is largely patriarchal. So I will say the end of the movie, there is a shot that is taken, like a very direct shot taken at the Ken's role in Barbie land moving forward. And you know, that takes a shot to say, hey, maybe the Ken's will have the power the women do in the real world. Okay, that's a shot at patriarchy. And once again, I'm gonna say it's an observation of reality that's been reversed. Usually when you do that, it's just called art. Apparently when Barbie does it, it, it makes conservatives upset. Now I wanna tell you flat out, the Barbie movie is not about feminism. It's not about patriarchy. If anything, I look at Bar when I saw Barbie, now I've seen it twice, so the second time, it, you know, I was looking for these themes, 
if anything, I think Barbie is very similar to, to the themes that Naomi Alderman brings up in her book, The Power, which is also an, an Amazon um, original going on right now. I'm actually going to link to The Power in, in the show notes because it's really an exceptional book, first of all. Um, I will say there are a couple of scenes that are that are violent and perhaps a bit disturbing. So other than that, really just a phenomenal book. And I'll get to why the, 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 um, there are parallels to it. But in, in the movie, Barbie Land, to, to be distinguished from the real world, Barbie Land is not better for having been run just by women to the exclusion of men. Everything seems very clean and very smooth, but life really has no spice to it. No, no, je ne sais quoi, because I don't speak French. So Barbie Land is also not better having been run by men to the exclusion of women. Life was had plenty of spice, and apparently it was also smelly and, and, and dirty as well. But both versions of Barbie Land, whether it was run by Barbies or whether it was run, run by Kens, are dystopic. That's the point of the movie. They are both dystopic. Both ignored one facet of life over the other, and both ended poorly. I think that this, what this does, if anything, it supports the idea that both men and women are vital to a smoothly running society. And this is how I feel it's, it's similar uh, with the way the power, the themes of the power play out. Because if you don't know that particular book, the main thing is that women end up developing a power, how about that, and they're able to take full control of society from men. And if you're, if you're following this at all, that doesn't end well either. So an interesting point that I, that I saw in, um, in the Barbie movie is that the Barbies don't want things to change. They want things to stay the same. They don't, they don't want, you know, to introduce anything that's too crazy. Ken's on the other hand, they do. They want all this kinds of all the all these kinds of great, you know, whatever men do, you know, hit each other, you know, slap high fives and all the stuff they do. Mini fridges, I don't know, like apparently mini fridges are a thing, you know, drinking beer and uh, slapping girls on the asses, stuff like that. What's interesting to me is that in this, Barbies are conservatives. Kens are liberals. Think about that. The Barbies, the women, are the conservatives. It's an interesting little point there. Because um, I think that if conservatives are screaming about this, all it does is it, they, it implies that they don't understand the ramifications of either masculinity or femininity. These are knee-jerk reactions to words, not ideas. It's certainly not a reaction to the story, I can tell you that, because it doesn't take a lot of looking at this movie to go, wait, what? This is, this is, not, uh, this is neither a, a, a feminist manifesto nor a really huge shot against the patriarchy. No doubt there are some, but the real meaning of this movie, now that I've seen it twice and so that makes me an expert on it, pretty much you watch a movie twice, it makes you an expert. The real meaning that I see in Barbie is that each of us needs to question who we are, why we do what we do. We aren't complete until we find a purpose, until we find a meaning to our existence that's outside of just excluding others. I think it also says very clearly that the meaning in life does not and cannot come from the glitter of technology and society. It has to come from within. And I think one of the biggest things that hits me so hard is that we must believe in who we are before it can manifest in our lives. I wrote an article that was sort of similar to that. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes. Why not? It was an article called Transgender Meh. I even actually filmed a video of that, but I think if these themes were missed, 
in favor of yelling about how feminism sucks, how patriarchy sucks or doesn't suck, how feminism doesn't suck. If somebody was able to miss these themes, I don't think they were reading the movie very deeply. I don't know, maybe that actually describes the people who are screaming about it. But as long as we're talking about identity, I also want to talk about a new friend of mine. Uh, her name is Jess Sikora. She gave me permission to talk about her today. And Jess founded a charitable organization that she calls uh, superbands.me. That's super bands. Like, uh, not rubber bands, actually musical bands, dot me. And she found it, I'll link to it in the notes. Don't even write it down. So she founded this organization in 2016. The purpose of this organization, and I'm not shilling for it, I wanna talk about why she founded this organization. She thought back to how she connected with music when she was 13. Now for her, it was the Jonas Brothers. And don't tell her, I don't think I could pick a Jonas Brother out of like a lineup, and I'm pretty confident I've never heard a Jonas Brothers song. But for Jess, these songs were uplifting. In her life, her parents were overbearing. Hopefully, if her parents are watching this, yeah, sorry, but you were a little overbearing. They seem to have somewhat ridiculous expectations of Jess. Jess was also bullied at school, which I think any of us can, can relate to the difficulty of being bullied. And Jess got to a point that she was depressed to the point of self-harm and suicidal ideations. All this at 13. 13. There are people out there right now saying, with 13, you don't know anything about life. How could you be depressed? Do you remember being 13? Because I'm guessing you don't. What Jess found, however, was that she could go to concerts, the Jonas Brothers concerts, and they helped her immensely because they gave her a sense of community and belonging that was absent from the rest of her life. They, she found if she could go, when she went to a concert, she was accepted. She was part of something bigger, and that helped her accept the rest of her life, what was kind of bad in the rest of her life. And so what she chose to do is found this charitable organization called Superbands.me, and its purpose is to get children to concerts, really. Get children engaged with music and the, the industry of music. Help them feel like they exist. Like they have identity because music touches us on a level that other things don't. Music can really bring us all together and music can really fire us up. Music makes us feel, makes us feel alive. So this organization, what, what Jess wants to do with it is help children get into that so that they also feel seen and heard and, and can work past these, these bad feelings, this depression, the self-harm, the suicidal ideation. Now here is the, the, the quick plug. The organization is struggling a little bit. If you can donate, I think that would be great. I'm not asking you to. If you can, please do. If you're in the music industry and you're watching this video, if you know people in the music, in the music industry, send them this video. Please spread the word about uh, superbands.me. Um, if you have other ways to contribute, who knows? Um, you can use the website, again, linked below. Contact Jess. You can even just donate monetarily if what you think is children of 13 years of age should not be thinking about ending their lives. Personally, I think that's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good cause. But I bring any of this up because both Jess and I are going at the same problem from two different directions. The top level issue that I see and that Jess sees is that youth today are not taught to investigate themselves. We're not taught, adults, college students, we are not taught to investigate ourselves, to think about who we are and how we manifest ourselves in society. The expectations 
of society end up being stronger than our ability to express ourselves outwardly. And this leads very directly to mental health issues. It could even lead to suicide. I ended up with four suicide attempts in my life. Clearly I didn't make it. And I'm fortunate. There are many children every year who are not as fortunate, who won't see 53. Shoot, did I just tell my age? Can you believe that? I think it's worth helping those children, personally. Where Jess and I differ, Jess wants to foster identity through connecting to music and connecting to other fans of that music. What I want to do is foster identity through connecting our gender expression to our deepest motiva motivations. But at the end, the goal is the same, which is that when we know who we are, we can accept ourselves better. And we ex when we accept ourselves, we feel better about ourselves, and we're actually capable of accepting other people. This was uh, Rollo May's big contribution to existential psychology, which is that being able to love ourselves means loving the world better. We're happier, the world's happier. It sounds like a good, it sounds like a good deal there. So, so that's my friend Jess, that's super band stop me. There is actually a segue into this, which is to say, um, into my next topic, sorry, which is to say, I want to talk about connecting gender expression to our deepest motivations. And I had a couple of conversations recently, well, yesterday, that's pretty recent, uh, that demonstrated sort of a common understanding of gender. Now, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I, I made a point to say, I had something in a Dingbat Weekly that mentioned how I think in abstractions, um, that I see things, I try to see things from, from a very high level. And I also believe very strongly because I see things from this somewhat high level, at high abstract level, that I believe that humans learn everything we know. I mean, and, and you know, learn has kind of a few connotations that doesn't make me necessarily an empiricist. Uh, it could be that, that we're learning about something that's inside. You know, we learn about our own deepest motivations and, and how it is that, that they manifest themselves. So, doesn't make me an empiricist, all of you philosophy majors out there. Um, but these conversations showed me that gender, at least by my two, by my two friends, that gender is, was, was perceived, at least in the moment, as sort of this mystical entity that we just kind of naturally know our gender and that gender is not a universal experience. Now, let me, I'll get to that point in a second. The first conversation I had is with a wonderful, a wonderful person named Kevin. Uh, he's with Prismatic Speech Services. I'm, I'm gonna link uh, Prismatic below. If you're looking for speech services as transgender or non-binary uh, expression, check out Prismatic. But Kevin wondered to me whether a cisgender spe speech, apparently maybe I need one of these, he wondered if a cisgender speech pathologist could understand the issues that transgender and non-binary people experience. The other conversation that I had was actually with Allison, my friend Allison from Speech 413, which is another speech service, um, a speech pathology service. Uh, sure. I'm going to link her below too. You know, both of them, Kevin and Allison, great at what they do. If you're transgender or non binary, reach out to them. But Allison wondered the same. Allison, I should have mentioned. Ke Kevin is a non binary, uh, is non binary. Allison is a cisgender woman. And Allison wondered the same. She wondered, does her experience as a cisgender woman, would it hinder her from working with transgender or non-binary people? Now, to me, what I see is that both conversations indicate that gender is perceived as something we have, not as something we develop. 
Now, this is something we build. Now, I believe very strongly that neither Kevin nor Allison would agree with the current anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, which claims that sex is gender. Both of these two, both Kevin and Allison, are very intelligent, very accomplished people, and both of them work with transgender and non-binary people daily. They're not discriminatory about gender identity, but what that showed me is at the same time, both of them believed that cisgender experiences are different from transgender or non-binary experiences, which I found very interesting. Now, I wrote an article actually some, some time ago about communication. It wasn't a great one. Maybe I'll link it, maybe I won't. But the, the point I made is that communication is very much our identity to society. It is our projection of identity out to the world. As such, communication is very highly gendered. Um, how, we, how we communicate an idea is very much informed by how we choose to present ourselves um, within a society. It plays very much into relationships and it plays a lot into our, into our ability to advocate for ourselves. But the projection, in my case anyway, of femininity is not owned by me. I mean, it's owned, if, if it can be owned at all, by the society in which I live as expectations. And each of us, as we grow up, must learn our gender expression, our own personal gender expression. Each of us must develop our own gender identity. Learning about gender, ding, hey kids, here's the, the point. Learning about gender is not just for transgender and non-binary people. Yes, sir, if you're cisgender, you can learn about your own gender too. So I want to go through a couple of examples because for some reason I felt like Cal Worthington and I don't even have a dog spot, so who knows what that is. Here's a couple of examples. Let me start with my own experience. Uh, my own experience of learning gender identity, that is. So first of all, probably not a surprise, I found it very difficult because what I wanted to express as a child would have been thought of as femininity. I wanted to, to think about dancing, um, dresses, gymnastics, makeup, things like that. Things that have been, that, that in Western society are thought of as feminine pursuits. But what was expected of me was masculinity. And, and it took me 52 years, ultimately. I just gave my age again. It took me 52 years to get to the point where I'm capable of expressing myself authentically in clothes, makeup, hair. Um, so that was my experience. Allison actually gave me a good one that uh, this was part of how I got into the conversation. She told me when she was, when she was very young, I don't know how very young is, but when she was young, she would go into her backyard and practice punting a football because she wanted her father to notice her. Her father um, wanted a son. And so what Allison's father expected of Allison was masculinity. Allison did what she could to learn how to express that. And, you know, thanks, Pop, I guess. Um, he stopped noticing her as soon as, you know, a son came along. I have another example that actually comes from Jason Provencio, who's gonna love being mentioned here, no doubt. Um, he wrote a, a recent article, and, and this recent article is about being bullied by a girl, and how being bullied by a girl was far worse than being bullied by a boy. And my first thought there, well, I mean, I guess my first thought was, hey, Jason, misogyny much? But my second thought, my very second thought, was that we all know, without reading the article, why being bullied by a girl was worse. I know it, you know it. 
you know, I mean, you, you could say, well, is it just physical? I mean, you know, Jason was small. He calls out how small he was. He was in seventh grade. She was in eighth grade. You know, the time when we all have our identity, right? I don't want to mess up the rest of the article. I'm actually going to link it because it's it's got a funny, it's got a funny, like, kick in the nuts story. And, uh, like, ladies, who can resist a good kick in the nuts story? And, uh, gentlemen... Who can turn away from a good kick in the nuts story, right? You know I'm right. You're going to go and read this just for that. But what's the common thread? Aside from kicks in the nuts, which I guess neither Allison nor I experienced, so it's not that. The common thread is that each of us experienced gender dysphoria. I wanted to express femininity. Allison was trying to express masculinity. Uh, Jason was having his masculinity squashed by femininity. Yikes. This is discomfort at expressing ourselves and not having it fit into some accepted social order. Um, for Jason and uh, Allison, at least presumably, it resolved. You know, it's likely that they aren't scarred today. Maybe. I, I mean, I guess I don't know. But they went through this just like I did. Marjorie Taylor Greene went through this just like I did. Donald Trump went through this just like I did. Matt Walsh went through this just like I did. And each of us, at our current ages, continues to go through this. Now, the difference is that cisgender people seem capable of resolving this discomfort. They can accept what is expected of them. They can live with it. I had a hard time doing that, and I see the only difference between cisgender and transgender people in terms of learning about our own gender identity is that I can't. I can't resolve it. I can't accept it. Now, maybe you could say I'm just an exceptionally slow learner, but I don't think that's the point. The point is that gender is something we develop. And on that note, that's it for the Dingbat Diaries Weekly for the week of August 4th, 2023. If you enjoyed this content, and hopefully you did, uh, make sure to like the video, like the audio, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You will receive new content uh, when it gets published. And if you could, please find my Substack publication in the show notes and subscribe from there to help me and Jess and Allison and Kevin and Jason help us continue this fight for identity and gender being normal aspects of human experience. Bye.